across somebody over and shook him and was getting ready to go to the goal and go for a dunk going backwards. And it surprised the people. They never thought that, that I could jump up this way. And so they were not looking for it. And when I went up to jump, something happened where I could not get as high as I normally thought I got. And I fell on my back. And I was there sitting down or laying down on my back. And I remember that somebody was there. They, they looked at me and they said, your shoes came off your feet. And so I was getting ready to look down and put my shoes back on. And I looked down and I noticed my shoes was not off my feet. That what had happened that I had twisted my ankle so much that my ankle had literally flipped around and my foot was pointing backwards. And I looked down and bless my heart, I didn't know any better at the point. I just said, man, I'm not going to play basketball for a little while. Then I went down and very quickly, the only thing I think to do was put it back in place. So I grabbed it and, and turned it back around. And everybody said, oh! And I got up I kind of tried to walk on it a little bit and it, it would not, uh, I couldn't get any good feeling on it. And I said, you know, I think you need to take me to the hospital. I left and someone wheeled me in and took me over to the hospital. And I remember as I was going in that the doctor began to look at my leg and he said, man, I can't believe you turned it back. He said, that was pretty good. He said, there's only one problem. He said, you put it in the wrong place. He said, I have to re-break it so that I can put it back in the right place. I said, all right. And so he began to start twisting on my ankle and putting it back in and I guess doing what those doctors do without anesthesia, just moving it. And all of a sudden I'm looking at him. He said, did I get it back in the right place? I said, did you? You're the doctor. <laughs> and he said, but, but, but you're not screaming out. Most people scream. You have high pain. Time. I said, just put it back in place. And he put it back in place. He said, because if I don't put it back in place, it won't heal right. And he put it back in and later on I had to have surgery on it. It was so bad it, it, it had ripped the, all the muscle of my leg and broke the bone on the side of my knee. And they had to put pins to put it back together. But he said, unless we put it back in the right place, it won't set and heal properly. And you know what the problem is sometimes? You see, we don't want to be hurt by God. We don't want to be cut by God. We don't want to be broken by God. But unless God breaks us, he cannot build us up. Unless God hurts us, he cannot heal us. Unless he cuts us, he cannot bring us back into the right position. But the problem is too many people, once they're broken, they see that their life is messed up. Normally, we try to put ourselves back in the right place. And you know what happens? We put ourselves in the wrong place. And so God in love, we're broken. We're ready now for something to happen. We're ready to try to put it in the right place. But the tendency is to put it not in the place that God wants us to put it. And unless we have a divine physician, unless we have Jesus Christ to make sure that once we're broken, we're put back in the right place, then everything that happened before to lead us to that breaking is in vain. Tonight, we want the great physician to put us in place. What do you say? Tonight, we want the great physician to refocus us, not on what the world does. You say, I had something else I'm going to share, but, but the Holy Spirit is moving me into a different direction. I can't talk about the events. I was going to show you some more events and showing us that we're in the last few months. But, but I believe those who have been coming out to the meetings, you know that. And we're going to have materials back there with DVDs that go through all of these events and show clearly that we are living in the last few months to the last few years before this National Sunday Law is passed. And unless we know Jesus, we're not going to be ready for this crisis. And so, brothers and sisters, let's just pray one more time before we open the word together. Amen. Father, anoint your words. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you will take your Bibles and turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 21. To the book of Luke chapter 21 and when you get there let me know by saying amen now if you have your Bibles I pray you didn't come to church without a Bible amen, amen. now I can tell those who've been coming to this meetings versus those who have come the first time all I have to do is say raise your Bibles if you if you raise your Bible if you have a Bible now if you raise your Bibles I know you've been at these meetings amen, amen. 
Now, you see, we found out that it is not wise to come to church without Bibles. We have found that though it has become fashionable to enter churches without Bibles, the only way that we can know the truth is not by the opinions of a man. I don't care who that man is or what church that man belongs to. We are even told that in this church, there will be men that stand behind this pulpit with torches that have been kindled by the hellish torch of Satan. And the only way to know the difference between the voice of God and the voice of men, the Bible says, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And the great reason why we have so many different denominations is because we have a lot of Bibles and yet many people listen to opinions instead of Bibles. If there is only one Bible, there should really only be one church. But the problem today is that man today would listen rather to what man has said about the Bible instead of studying the word of God for themselves. But I've told you, brothers and sisters, that the Antichrist is soon to make his marvelous appearance in our sight that the last great delusion is soon to open before us. And we've been told in this last hour that Satan is going to work miracles that are going to be so, so looking like the genuine that it's only going to be possible to distinguish between them by the Holy Scriptures. By their testimony, every statement and every miracle must be tested. And unless we come back to the Bible, we're going to be deceived in this last hour. And Jesus said, brothers and sisters, when those disciples came to him, they said, tell us, what shall be the sign of thy coming? And the end of the world. And Jesus gave them clear signs. In fact, notice what the Bible says, beginning in verses 9 of Luke 21. Beginning in verse 9, are you there, Amen. Notice what it says, beginning in verse 9. Let's read that together. The Bible says, But when ye shall hear of what? Of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not yet. It's by and by. In other words, when we see the wars and the rumors of wars, God said, this is not it. This must be. There is still something coming greater, and we have learned from night after night that tonight we are on the verge of a great crisis. Right as I speak tonight, the world is getting ready to make their decision over the seal of God and the mark of the beast. And tonight, it looks as if there is a great number of denominations. We can list hundreds upon hundreds of different denominations and religious faith. But the Bible says that when this thing comes to pass in just a few short months, that every denomination of this world are going to be split into just two religions. It's not going to be 101 and 102. The whole world is either going to be on the side of God or going to be on the side of those who receive the seal of God or they're going to receive the mark of the beast. The Bible says there's only two churches. The Bible says that there's that woman of Revelation 12 and that woman of Revelation 17. I'll never forget, I was there going to a funeral in California. And I was there at this particular house, and I was there at the getting ready, and I said, you know, I always meet different of religious faith. I don't want to just always try to make it like I'm trying to show them something they don't, don't, don't know. And I was out there, and I saw some Jehovah's Witness coming up the road. And I said, there are many sincere believers in the Jehovah's Witness faith. I said, Lord, I don't want to have to try to talk with them today about the Bible. They're going to try to convert me. You know what happens, don't you? And so I said, I'm going to make sure that I, that I leave my Bible in the house so I'm not even tempted to, to show the truth to them. I said, I know they're sincere. So I went into the house and I put my Bible in. And then all of a sudden, you know, providence is a strange thing. All of a sudden, they were way down the road. And I quickly went in back in the house. And then I said, well, let me, I, I need to get something for my wife. And I went outside. And all of a sudden, guess who was at the door? I said, oh, Lord. And so I stood there. And the two was standing there. And they said, do you know that the world is getting ready to come to an end? I said, yes, I believe that very sincerely. I said, I believe that too. They said, oh, you believe that? I said, yes. All the signs point that the world is coming to an end. They said, that's right. They said, are you sure you're in the right church? And I said, I'm sure I'm in the right church. And they said, well, I'm not so sure if you can be so sure. Do you know what the Bible says? And I said, well, tell me, what does the Bible say? 
And so they begin to start talking about what the Bible says about the church and how many people are in the wrong church. I said, well, that's very interesting. I see you have a Bible there. I said, turn in your Bible to Revelation 12 because the Lord said, just tell them the truth. I said, okay. I said, turn in your Bible to Revelation 12. I didn't have my Bible, so I said, use your Bible. So they go to Revelation 12. Now I said, do you know that in the Bible, the Bible likens in the book of Revelation a woman to a church? And they said, what? I said, look over in Jeremiah, and they went over to Jeremiah, and I showed them the text where it said that, that, that a, a woman in Bible prophecy represents a church. A pure woman represents a pure church, and a harlot woman represents a harlot church. And they looked, and they said, man, i never seen this. This is getting a little bit too deep for me. I said, no, but you stop me, amen. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute. And I started talking and I said, now, this says the church. And I said, this gives an identifying mark of what God's church should look like. I said, look at this pure woman. This is a pure church. I said, look at all the identifying marks because I believe anything the Bible says. If my church does not line up with this, then I'm going to a different church. I want to follow Jesus. I'm not interested in following a man. I'm not interested in following the ideas or the opinions of men. I'm only interested in following Jesus. And Jesus said he did not live by tradition. He lived by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And a true Christian, they're not going to listen to what their pastor says or their church says if it violates this Bible. And so I started talking with them and they looked and the little girl that was with the person looked over and said, what are you going to say to that? Mother looked over and said, well, I wasn't expecting this. And I said, now, are you sure that this is your church? And she looked a little bit stable. I said, I know you're very sincere. I said, there are not even people who have the truth that are walking and, and knocking on doors like you are. You know, if we had the truth, shouldn't we be knocking on doors? And I said, you are very sincere. I said, if you are sincere and you're open and honest, God will lead you into the right truth. I said, if I were you, I would study this chapter. And they said, but... And I said, well, you know, the Bible says what day the Sabbath is. And they said, oh, you're talking about that Sabbath. You know that, 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 that all you do is, is, is you're taking pagan traditions. Don't you know you're keeping pagan traditions? And they said, you can't keep a birthday. You, you know, in, in many of the faith of Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't celebrate birthdays. Now, I said, now, that's not in the Bible. They said, what do you mean? I said, the Bible says in Psalms that teach me to number my days. And a birthday, numbers of days. I said, the Bible told us to number our days, to apply our hearts to know wisdom. That's what the Bible says. I said, but now that you brought up paganism. I said, do you understand where Sunday worship came from? And they stepped back for a moment because, you see, they understand. They studied through paganism. And they went back and I said, do you know that this is how we got the names of the week? Sunday for the honor of the sun god and Monday for moon's day and all the rest. I said, if you say that it's pagan to celebrate Christmas and all the rest, you tell me why you are still going to church on Sunday. And I said, you tell me why. And, and, and she says, but, but nothing in the Bible tells us what the day is. I said, wait a minute, you have a Bible. Turn to this. And we went from text to text. And she looked there, and all of a sudden, she began to start closing her Bible. And the, the little girl said, but mother, aren't you going to say something? And she went back in, and she, she went back into her Bible. You know, the Jehovah's Witness, they have studies that they go through. And there was in the Bible, 